Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Paul Briscoe, and I'm very proud to be part of Tag Video Systems. And joining me today is uh, my colleague and very good friend, Pini Maron. He is our uh, VP of Hi, Professional guys. Services. Hey, Pini. And hello, everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. Welcome. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, something interesting today. Uh, it's very timely because we see the world changing, as you may have heard if you were listening to Pini and I chatting. Uh, television, especially live television, has undergone a vast change. We won't talk about sports. Well, actually, we, I'll briefly mention that sports has moved to esports because sports aren't happening right now. But the bigger thing is that the live shows, such as talk shows, have moved to remote production instantly, overnight, in a very haphazard and terrifying way. And it's working out. And this is great. And this is indeed the future of live production and the future of how we make media. So it's timely that we talk about this stuff. So what we'd like to talk about today is production infrastructures for live. And the live production infrastructures um, that we know about are, are typically the sort of things that are part of a TV plant. Let me, let me just show you a little picture here. I think I can do that like this. So many buttons. There we go. So assuming I can do this. Come on. There we go. So here's, you know, sort of a block diagram of facilities. And I have a little laser pointer here I'll just pick up and use to point around. So this is the kind of the overall world of things. And oh, I can't do that. Darn. What we're going to talk about in particular is what's in red. So we're not really interested in play out. We're not interested in delivery particularly. What we really want to focus on today is live production because this is the important piece of work uh, that has been affected by COVID, but it's also something very important for what we do. So in these facilities, we're talking about hardwired facilities, typically based on routing switchers, uh, with a common control room, a bunch of people sitting in a room yelling at each other to make a TV show, under time pressure, and so on. Typically, these are with limited connectivity. You have external sources, and they're hardwired, and they're nailed up, and you use them uh, as though they're in plant but there's no real dynamic connectivity to the outside world. Um, so external collaboration becomes logically and technically a bit difficult. Now, this is as opposed to what we're going to talk about today, which is remote production, which goes by the strange name REMI, R-E-M-I. Remote integration is what that stands for, and it's kind of a strange term, but that's what it's being called. And it's all about remote collaboration, and it's all about remote production, the ability to do something with people not all in the same room. And COVID has helped us start to figure that out rapidly. And today, live production is glued together with consumer tools and some broadcast tools and a whole bunch of pieces of kit and a lot of bailing wire and a bit of chewing gum. And it's not really a seamless solution, and it's certainly not particularly scalable. Uh, Peeny, why don't you talk to us a little bit about the IP world and, uh, and why hardware uh, is actually kind of dead. Okay. Uh, if we look at the, at the history, and not very long history back, uh, IP actually got into our broadcast world uh, through the, the use of uh, delivery and the contribution. And it really was with the, with the use of uh, the MPEG compression. And that was the first, uh, the first time that uh, IP and IP infrastructures were used uh, within the broadcast facilities. It was very, used very, very strongly for, uh, for, as I said, for uh, delivery with satellite, cable, and, uh, and other uh, broadcast means. Uh, but, uh, but it actually stayed there until very recently that uh, the Sentry actually established a set of standards that can allow for the, for the uncompressed signals to be carried over IP as well. We, we probably all know about the 2022-6 and the 2110 uncompressed uh, standards. And once uh, those are uh, actually implemented and uh, finalized and people are starting to, to have uh, equipment for that and use it, it really becomes an uh, enabler to use the IP for the, for the new era of the facility infrastructure because the, the, usage, the usage on IP, uh, really the ability to, to ride on it, to use it uh, in, the, in the facility is really what, uh, what will make the difference. And this is what uh, we will be talking uh, during the webinar. So <clears throat> the first thing that came after the, the IP uh, is the ability also to, to have the solutions based on uh, software applications running on, on uh, codes 
IT commonly available hardware. So if you take uh, those, thing, those two things together, we take the, you know, the IP by itself and then the ability to have applications and uh, solutions running uh, on software on the, on the COTS, uh, COTS hardware, you really can, uh, are getting to a tremendous uh, benefits, both commercially and uh, technically, uh, which, uh, which really translate to, to, to um, uh, what we call the three pillars of, uh, of the, the new uh, facility ar architecture, which is really flexibility, agility, and scalability, which we will talk about a bit later. Uh, <clears throat> the idea of, of having a facility where you are not using dedicated uh, hardware and you are not attached to, to a specific hardware at a specific location can really make uh, the difference. And if you look at the trends that are now uh, starting to, to develop, uh, one can only make a, an observation and, uh, and an assumption that uh, the, the, the hardware solutions that we are uh, knowing them and used to, to, to employ are pretty much uh, going to be dead. And I think uh, I just read a recent uh, article of an interview of uh, Richard Fidel, the EVP of Engineering and Operations uh, and Technology for Fox. Which, uh, which actually said, uh, in my opinion, two, two statements uh, which really cover it all and actually summarize it. And I'm quoting, it says, the long-term uh, trail of, uh, of, the, of the disease, of the, the, the corona uh, will impact the industry uh, and, and it will actually uh, come to focus starting with a swift adaptation of the cloud and IP infrastructures. So this is really something that, uh, that I think actually summarizes what we are talking about the new facility. And then another thing that he said is uh, we are going to make uh, <clears throat> this, this uh, more part of our DNA of our group. So really what he's saying is forget what you know, we are going, we are going somewhere new and this is going to be uh, the things uh, that will uh, that will stay and will actually dominate our uh, our industry. And that's his vision. Uh, Paul, maybe well, you can it, take it back. Well, if, if anybody should know, it would be Richard. Uh, they produce a vast amount of television. And, and Richard's actually presently quite famous because he was the inventor of putting saran wrap over the consoles uh, for actually allowing people to work in a studio. So they sterilize the studio, they put, they put plastic wrap around everything people touch, they do their TV show, they rip up the plastic wrap and sterilize again. It's just, it's just brilliant simplicity. But it, it, it shows you the kind of steps people are going to, in addition to the technical and operational challenges and production challenges, just you know the things that have to be considered to work in this world. So, so let me give a little context, Penny, to back up what you're talking about here. Um, and hopefully this little slide share here will do this for me. Um, I, I got to apologize. I'm, I'm one slide away from where I want to be. Let me go back a slide. There we go. Here's a typical SDI live production architecture. We're, we're all kind of familiar with this, right? We have, uh, we, we have a core SDI router, which sits in the middle of everything. That's this funny representation shown as a bunch of lines in blue, uh, which is just the easier way to draw an SDI router. If you've ever made a drawing, you know, putting everything around a box in the middle is very hard. And so you have your usual pieces you'd expect, your usual players in the, in the facility for live production. You have your cameras, you have some remote feeds coming in, you probably have remote feeds coming from the internet as opposed to a traditional method like satellite or landline. And today you probably have a whole bunch of internet content coming in from various things, all of them coming in through some kind of PC-based device to turn the internet into SDI. And we have the usual clip and replay and graphics and character gen and the vision mix and so on. And in modern worlds, of course, we have multi-viewers, and these drive video walls for various purposes uh, in operational use. So when we move to IP, what does our production architecture look like? Well, the way it's rolling out is like this. Here's the SDI production architecture, and here's the IP production topology. Can you see the difference? So the difference is that it's an IP switch fabric and probably a bunch of gateways if you have SDI equipment still in operation. But the production workflow remains very similar. So we move to IP and we build the same old studio again, and that's a start. That's a very, very good start. But we haven't, we haven't advanced anything to do with the production technologies we're using. So if we draw that a little differently, it looks like this. 
right? We have a data center. We could call it central equipment if you want, but I want to call it a data center. There's a reason. Because instead of broadcast equipment, you notice everything in the data center is based on some kind of compute, some kind of server, some kind of engine running software, not a piece of dedicated hardware made by one of the big manufacturers. Instead of software, hopefully made by one of the big manufacturers and or a manufacturer who's not quite as big like TAG, and it lives in your data center. The studio now is still all the stuff you expect. It's the operational positions, it's the cameras perhaps, it's the visualization, all the people are still in that room, but the guts are in the data center. And this opens the door now to doing some new and interesting things. We can now look at gaining flexibility, agility, and scalability through the use of IP. Uh, Pini, tell us some more about that. Yeah, this is what uh, you know, we would like you to gain out of this uh, webinar is that uh, the, the, <clears throat> the ability to use the, uh, or to, to gain this uh, flexibility, agility, and so forth uh, is something that, uh, that was not really uh, commonly known or used uh, before that. And I will start with one aspect of it. The fact that we are now using uh, data centers uh, really gives us uh, the flexibility to play with, uh, with licenses, because once we have this uh, situation uh, we, uh, where we have uh, multiple applications residing on, uh, on COTS uh, servers, then uh, you, you can actually make what you want by, by actually applying a certain uh, license to, uh, to a certain server and getting uh, your application running. However, you know, in the, in the hardware world uh, where, where everything was rigid, a license was residing on a specific box, and this is all you could do. Now, if you want to do it in another box, you had to buy another license and so forth. So we, with, with the tag, came up with, the, with an approach and idea, which is really, I think, taking these sentences of flexibility, agility, and scalability to the, to the highest level. We came up with a, with a concept that we call uh, zero friction, where, in essence, um, all the equipment is utilizing the same uh, uh, the, the utilizing licenses in order to to gain uh, uh, or to use uh, different uh, applications or different features within applications. So in essence, uh, you as the customer, you are actually acquiring a, a, pool, a pool or a bank of licenses, and at Atwill you can uh, you can uh, assign those uh, those licenses to any piece of uh, of course hardware any kind of application which can be residing on it already and in no time you can actually uh, use it in a different location and a different uh, room for a different function and it's all it's all ready for you in, in really no time so you say okay the difference is that because of that you can actually share the licenses for different applications and different uh, time zones and, and uh, re reduce the number of uh, licenses you need to acquire. Think of it like if you have a currency in your pocket and you just use it to buy what you need. But the nice thing about it and twist here is that once it, the currency gets back to your pocket and you can use it now to do something else. So this is something that we feel is really very, very significant. And, and again, it's, it's enabled by the new uh, IP world and infrastructure that uh, facilities are going to be using today. Paul? Uh, yeah, let me show you a little bit about that in action, maybe, because this flexibility and agility is really key. So here, here's an example uh, that I like. Uh, this is actually an example of a real customer. And uh, they have a local data center in their facility where they have a huge IP-based production facility, uh, you know, resource base. And, and of course, it's just a room full of servers running software performing these different applications, and then they have a large number of studio control rooms. Now, in the case of this particular situation, they're doing uh, remote sports production. So while they're doing, um, while they're doing football in one studio, uh, they could be doing football for an entirely different market in yet another studio control room, and a third one is dark. So at a given time of the day, this may be the, sh the layout of shows, but they may move from doing football in this studio to another show uh, in the same studio, or they may make this studio where the laser pointer is go dark, and they may light up this studio for another purpose. So what they can do, of course, is use this pool of licenses in TAG or in any other product that supports this concept to move these licenses around and use them as they require.
the point here being that if they have three studio control rooms, they don't have to have equipment for three studios worth of product as long as they never exceed two studios of simultaneous capacity. So this way they can tune their operation and they can tune their equipment or their software by to match their needs. And it gives them this agility and this flexibility. And they can do this quickly. If this was a news environment and something happened in the news, they could stand up a control room and acquire the resources and be on air super fast. It goes further than this. Let's have a look now of something more global. We have New York and we have Paris. There's local data centers and a broadcaster in each location. And let's say that in New York is where the venue is and there's a bunch of cameras there and there's a production control room there. And that data center that's producing this show in the New York area is linked via the internet. And the internet, everyone knows, is a big, ugly yellow lightning bolt to a data center um, in Paris. And they have two studios there to handle the same production in different languages with different focuses on, on areas of interest and so on. And they've now done a hybrid cloud-based production. They're actually doing something in the data domain connected across a huge geography. So again, this flexibility can be used. Resources in either one of these data centers can be used by any piece of this system. So we have the ability now to use our resources most flexibly and have the agility we need to do dynamic production. Pini, tell us more. Yeah, okay, I just saw, so uh, we had uh, something, uh, somebody asking regarding uh, the data centers, where are they located in general with respect to the, to the studios? And ah. it's really, the, the whole idea of using IP is that it uh, unties the, the physical necessity of the physical connection between the, between the data centers and the studios or we're actually using the application. I mean, the data center can be located in, uh, in the facility itself serving all the facilities, all the production rooms, all the editing base, everything within that facility, or it can be located in a central, uh, central location and uh, actually servicing uh, multiple uh, facilities uh, utilizing the same data center. Obviously, you know, the more, uh, more facilities using the same data center, the more, uh, uh, the more uh, robust the solution is and uh, the better you can share the resources. And, uh, and, ag and again, it leads directly to actually moving uh, the data center to be in the cloud. Uh, this is, this is the, the, uh, the natural uh, migration. So as, as we said in the beginning, uh, beginning uh, the IP uh, world actually opens uh, a bunch of uh, opportunities to really um, untie the physical connection between equipment, people, application, and sites. I mean, this is really the, 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 the underlining of, of this whole uh, uh, trend that we are uh, discussing. And, um, and you can see that, that we are only in the beginning of this process. I think we are only uh, touching the, the tip of the iceberg because uh, the possibilities are probably endless. And as we start using it, we will think of other ways of applications to actually uh, utilize it. And you can take as a sample uh, the use of, uh, of Zoom, as we just discussed earlier. I mean, who would think Zoom will be part of uh, making a, a TV production or talk show or whatever? And here it is, and probably going to be here some, some way or form will be here to stay. So, so yeah. this is why we have a really very strong feeling about it, that, that this is only the beginning. I mean, we are here for a long yeah. run to, to utilize it. Oh yeah, th there's no turning back. Yeah, I, I love when we have an audience so engaged that the question from the audience forces me to put up the next slide to give context to your answer. <laughs> it's, it's precisely the right place that they're going with this question. I had started by talking about local data centers. This is your new modern central equipment room, but it's all data equipment. There's no, I'm not gonna name vendors, there's no vendor specific broadcast equipment in there. It's all software running on servers. And what that means then is that this thing called the cloud, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, not gonna name offenders in that, in that regard, but you, there's many people selling cloud services now. And that same data center capability can simply live in the cloud. So the same production doesn't necessarily have to have in, in New York, that data center that's local to the Paris site they can do all of this in the cloud or vice versa. Those two sides could swap. So your local data center, which used to be your broadcast specific bespoke control room, it's now an IT control room running broadcast applications. You can now look to moving them into the cloud. And if this advances my slide, 
And so where we actually get to eventually is something like this. There's nothing that prevents us from moving all of the production processing into the cloud. And we can now change the domain of how we do production. So for example, we have our prod production resources in the cloud. We still have our cameras in Paris. They're still shooting the football game. Everybody's interconnected on the web through intercom. See the little headsets here? Everybody's got a headset on. They're all in the same room, just like we're all in the same room, even though we're scattered all around the globe. All the same functions exist, but also their means of operation have changed. There's no more dedicated control panels, right? Character gen is a laptop. Camera shading is some kind of interface and a nice screen. The prompter may be on a pad. The reporter doing a live hit may be on a telephone. Your advertiser may be watching the show on a phone. Your engineer may be keeping track of technical operations on a phone. Your director's in the Caymans. He doesn't care. He's watching a screen and calling the show. The TD, so, uh, sorry, that's the TD down here. The actual show director's up here. The point is nobody has to be anywhere anymore. Now, this is the model we're working under with COVID right now anyhow, but this is the desired model for the future. Why do you need a brick and mortar building, a fancy control room, people coming in on shift, travel if you're doing remotes, on and on and on? There's no reason that, like me, your character gen operator can't be sitting in their underwear looking like they're, well, they don't even get seen, right? The whole point being, you open up a whole door to casual and cost-reduced operations by doing this. And by moving everything into a cloud data center, you end up with this beautiful flexibility, this beautiful agility, and this beautiful scalability. As well, of course, in the cloud, it's natural to take in web feeds. You want Zoom? You don't need to bring it in through a PC and turn it into SDI or turn it into broadcast IP. It's a web feed. You bring it into the cloud. That's native. The same for broadcasting out. We leave the web uh, from the cloud. We get to OTT and linear, also out of the cloud. In fact, we can even feed the local over-the-air transmitter coming back out of the cloud. So there's no reason that the cloud cannot become the basis for live production. Playout already lives in the cloud. The other thing that's interesting, separate from the technology under the hood, is the evolution of human interfaces. And it's this simple. We're used to control rooms full of special custom bespoke equipment. We don't need it. Even technical directors are okay to switch on something besides a high travel button, big panel switcher. So we now see computer products as becoming, consumer computer products as becoming the interfaces for production because we can put GUIs on them that do the job. So control interfaces move to laptops and tablets, small screens, and the same with viewing. We can display our multi-views anywhere on any device. So what picture you need on your screen to do your job, we can provide. Uh, we had the two questions in between, and one of them uh, yeah. has, to do, has to do with the bandwidth between the facilities and between the data. But obviously, it all depends on the amount of data to move and the amount, uh, amount of uh, cameras and what uh, uh, in the production gear and so forth that you want to move. And higher level uh, production work and to do many get a suitable uh, uh, network uh, connectivity but uh, obviously there are, uh, there are some uh, some aspects also to to be able to mildly compress uh, uh, the sources uh, and volume uh, uh, that uh, that can uh, alleviate uh, this thing Talk about uh, sources uh, which are uh, by uh, by definition are low latency sources. The, and we are talking uh, networks uh, moving in the speed of light, then uh, there shouldn't be any significant uh, barrier with latency between, uh, between the sites because it's, it's an IP and it's one network and it's all running at the same, uh, at the same time. So on the face of it, uh, I think uh, it should work fine and it, it does work fine. So as we can see, I mean, it's, it's really happening. So, uh, you know, I think, I, uh, you know, uh, Paul, again, Yes, Paul? Oh, I was just going to say, you know, you speak of bandwidth, so I'll, I'll reveal my age. I mean, my earliest connection to anything external uh, was actually a dial into a mainframe, a time-sharing mainframe at a 300 baud. Okay, so we all know that bandwidth keeps going up over time. And within the cloud, bandwidth isn't really an issue. It's getting to and from the cloud today. So there's still stuff we can't do in the cloud quite as directly as we want to. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff left to do, and it's coming, and it's coming fast. But things like in 2110, for example, we build on top of a UDP multicast environment. 
This is not presently available in the cloud, but coming real soon. We use PTP for synchronization. We need a similar mechanism in the cloud. Uh, you talk about bandwidth, Pini. Right now, today, we don't necessarily, at every place in the world, have enough bandwidth to get broadcast quality or broadcast type production signals into the crowd. But we use mezzanine compression. Hell, we even use Zoom, and we use it adequately. So these things, while introducing a bit of latency, get the job done today, and these will fade over time and become less necessary as bandwidth becomes, you know, basically ubiquitous. You know, I have a gigabit right now to my basement here, and if you asked me back in the 300 baud days where I have a gigabit coming into my house, you know, in such and such a year, I probably would have said, yeah, probably would I have a flying car in the driveway, right? It, it will just keep going. So that's all important. But other things are important too, especially in the cloud. Things like security, security of the link. Security in the cloud, security for your content, access control. You may be moving very, very valuable content around, and you need to know that unlike your own private wires in your old world, you're in a public world. So now security, integrity of software systems, all these things become very, very important. And finally, web service integration. We typically integrate the web today with our productions through some kind of a intermediary, a gateway, a conversion device. When we move to the cloud, we are the web. And if you watch YouTube, if you watch any streaming OTT, you know the web is now television. So we're in the right place. And when we move to IP, we now integrate with everything out there in a very natural and organic way. So, Pini, do we have any more questions? You've been watching the chat, I know. Any more questions? Well, actually, maybe just before that, maybe I want to, to kind of recap uh, what we try to actually uh, present and uh, relate today is, is the fact that... Uh, uh, migrating to IP, which is going to happen, uh, has tremendous advantages, and in the excuse me, in the flexibility, agility, and scalability of the systems, and uh, moving it into the cloud even makes it uh, more. And we feel that this trend uh, will happen, will stay, and uh, will actually change. The the type of things to come, and uh, po hopefully for the better. This is uh, oh. this is our belief on it. Always for the better, and y you know the the important note message I think to take away from this is that I mean IP is here and IP will not go away. Uh, and I want to share one more slide with you in a second uh, on that point because somebody far more knowledgeable than me said something far more important I think about this, but. The important thing here is the, the zero friction licensing model or the concept of being able to move licenses between applications freely on demand and scale up and down as you need um, brings you the power of the cloud because in your own data center, you have limited amount of hardware. So license mobility is important, but at some point you do have a finite amount of hardware. For anyone's intents and purposes, the cloud has an infinite amount of computing horsepower, an infinite amount of storage, and an infinite amount of connectivity for practical purposes. So in that environment, the ability to spin up applications and apply licenses to them to operate becomes incredibly powerful. So no longer do you have to deploy pre-configured, pre-licensed applications. If you need five more multi-viewers or two more vision mixers or 20 more character generators, you spin them up, you throw a license at them, and you're on the air. So that's the power of this concept that we're using at TAG, and we hope other manufacturers will embrace as well, this idea of common license pools, the idea of licensing on the fly, configuration on the fly, and dynamic system building. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. I hope you've enjoyed our, our little informal conversation here. I do know that many uh, vendors and others are putting on, <laughs> in the absence of NAB, it's, it's, it's webinar month, as it will be for some time. And uh, I've seen a number of fairly professional-looking webinars. I've seen some attempts at professional-looking webinars. And we've opted for the casual conversation and, and hopefully share some useful information with you. And I hope you've taken at least one piece of information with you uh, today away from this. And if, there is, if you haven't really distilled one, I think the one I'd like to leave you with is actually a quote from uh, Richard Friedel, uh, the author of that uh, article that was mentioned uh, from, from Fox. Because he really nails it. Let me uh, throw up a photo here in a little statement. There's Richard Friedel sitting in his hand sanitized control room. Uh, you don't see the saran wrap on the consoles right now. But anyway, his quote uh, is a very timely one. And assuming I push the right button here, the screen will change. Oh, come on screen. This is a time of change with IP coming. People are going to be working in different ways. We're going to have different workflows. 
Some will probably continue forever. This is a man who knows more about this stuff than everybody on the call put together, quite possibly, unless he's on the call. Hello, Richard. But this last statement, some will probably continue forever, is a very conservative statement of where the future is going. What we're doing with IP is not going to end. It is going to continue. And we don't have a choice in the matter. So <laughs> welcome to IP, folks. We're there, and we're going to have a great time. I'd like to invite you to visit our website, tagvs.com. On the website, you will find all sorts of useful information, white papers, articles, including the one just mentioned. And also, if you'd like a free demo of our tag product, we can deploy that real easily for you because, of course, all the stuff you just heard, we can have you up and running in a very short period of time, and you can try it out for yourself. So by all means, please feel free to contact us. And if there's any more questions, uh, we'd be happy to see them in the chat box. And uh, if Peeny's watching it, we can, uh, we can answer them now. If you're leaving, thank you so much for your attendance. We appreciate you coming. And please, by all means, feel free to follow up with us. Just drop tag a note uh, on the website and the appropriate uh, person, be it me, Peeny, or whoever, will be happy to get back to you. Bye-bye. Thanks.